additions? Do we need to know the adrenergics and all those additional ones? Okay, because there wasn't another slide, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about sinus, sinus, radius, sinus sac. Here's the thing I always tell people when you're starting with rhythms. It is very overwhelming, guys, okay? It's like, a, it's like a new language that you're just learning how to speak. The only way you're gonna get good at it is practice, okay? Um, I, today I'll release videos that I have created on each individual rhythm that you can always get back and review. I also have a link that it says EKG resources in there and you can click on it. Uh, it's a link that will take you to like practice EKG sites so you can go and you can practice there. If you find some that you think you're great, just shoot me to, shoot them to me an email and I'll post them for the class if you found something better than what I have right there because I'm all about sharing. But it's okay when you leave here to feel overwhelmed, okay? What I need you to do though is go home, take a little break, and then get back at it and do one at a time until you really learn that one, then go to the next, okay? Don't try and do everything at one time because you just a little bit. You will have to do strip recognition on the test. I will have like 15 strips and you have to recognize, okay? Um, so they're the ones that we're going over. In addition to that, I also will have strips on the test that say, based on this, what would you do next? Based on this, what's the priority? Okay, so don't just focus so much on learning the to recognize it, that you forget you gotta know what to do once you recognize it, okay? Because usually that's what some of my students will do. They've got all 15 of those right, and that's the only 15 they got, because they forgot about, <laughs> hey, I gotta know what to do for it, okay? But that's what we do in nursing. We have to be able to recognize an issue, and then we gotta do something about it. So don't forget those interventions. What you got? So outside of your are you mean like you gonna have questions that ask? I'll have a strip and you say um, it'll say um, based on this based on your interpretation what would you do next so that's outside of knowing uh -huh. what it is mm -hmm. so you'll have the, you'll have 15 that'll say what is this rhythm and you've got your little selections and you select and then you'll have some strips that say what would you do next based on this because that's what, a lot of times what we do if we hook up something we're like, oh gosh, gotta do something. Now I need you to, to do that. Okay? So let's start talking about the first thing. We're gonna talk about the five step method. Okay guys, until you get like super awesome at reading strips, I want you to use the five step method. Okay? It's gonna seem a little tedious at first because I do it for every single one but it helps get you in practice and it helps you realize, okay, what am I looking at with this? So in the five-step method, you look at the heart rate, you look at the rhythm, you look at P waves, PR intervals, and QRSs. This is everything we just covered, guys, essentially, okay? So for every strip I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the five-step analysis of it. So when you go back and you practice, you will know what you're looking for, okay? So the very first thing that you wanna do is you want to determine the heart rate. So remember I told you um, we determine heart rate on a six second strip. So you, six seconds, right here, if you look at your hash marks, from hash mark to hash mark, that's three. And then from this one to this one, that's three. So this whole thing is six seconds. For testing purposes, every strip I give you, you can assume it's six seconds. I'm not gonna make you figure it out and then figure out what the rhythm is, okay? So it's six second strips. To find a heart rate using the six second method, what you're gonna do is you're gonna count the number of complete QRSs in that six seconds. So how many complete QRSs do I have right here? Five. Is everybody good with that? Does everybody see it? Complete, so meaning it has the QRS. So one, two, three, four, five, okay? Five times 10 is what? My rate's 50. Let's try it again. And the course is like, no. <laughs> oh, please, please. No, no, I'm assuming you know that one, okay? I'm more interested in priority, delegation. What would you do next? You're smart. You're in here. I know that, okay? How many complete curiosities do I have right here? Seven. 
Seven, right? So seven times ten is? Seven. Look at you awesome folks. Okay? How many number of complete cuirasses do I have? Four. Four times ten is? Forty. Forty. Guys, you just learned how to do the heart rate. Okay? <laughs> Okay, we got to start at the beginning. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. Okay. So now that you know how to determine um, the heart rate, let's talk about the rhythm. That's the next thing you look at. So when we're looking at the rhythm, what we're doing is we are measuring the R to R to see is it regular or is it irregular. That's what we're looking for. So what I would love for you to do is um, – for my people that have their book, look on page 641. For my people that don't have their book, it's okay. You can do this. But what? So to measure your R to R's, what you do, go to the first R in your um, strip. Okay? My paper's not long enough, but I would put an R right here. I would put a line right here and a line right here. And then what I do is I measure it up to the next. If it's regular, they're going to match. Okay? So look on your 641. Take like a little scrap sheet of paper. And then you're going to measure your first R to R. So just put two little marks. And then go to your next one and they should match up if it's regular. Okay? Are you good with that yeah, one? Showing up how? Okay. Michelle, are you good with, with that one? You just do that for the mm -hmm. And then you can do a comparison of all your other ones, and it should all be that same. So it's regular. Are you good with that? Yeah, you should have to be the same. Uh huh, you're just making sure the distance between the
When you look at your P wave, what you're looking for is that you have a P wave before every QRS, and your P waves are similar in appearance. Okay? So let's go up here. The first thing you gotta do is you gotta find your P waves. But remember, your P waves are the first wave in the cycle. If you get confused, guys, it's always easy to find, the easiest thing to find is that QRS complex. Find that R. If it's before it, it's your P wave. If it's after it, it's your T wave. Okay? Here's my QRS complex. Here's a P. I go to the next one. There's my P. Here's my P. Here's my P. And here's my P. So I do have a P before every QRS, and my P's are similar in appearance. Okay? So then the fourth thing we look at is we look at that PR interval. Remember, your PR interval tells you how long it takes in an electrical impulse to get from the atria to the ventricles. We measure it from the beginning of our P to the beginning of our QRS. What we're looking for, we're looking to make, the, make sure that it's consistently the same. Okay? So when you're looking at that PR interval, what you should be looking for is you should have a range between 0.12 and 0.20. So no more than five small boxes. So I would measure it right here, the beginning of my P to the beginning of my QRS, which of course, that's my Q. So from here to here, okay? And that's four boxes. So if I measure it here, then that should be four boxes, that should be four boxes, that should be four, and that should be four. It should consistently be the same, okay? And then the last thing you look at, guys, is you look at your QRSs. What we're looking for when we look at our QRSs is that our QRSs are similar in appearance, okay? And that they're within defined limits. So that's the last thing you need to do. I know it seems like it's a lot, but until you get really good at reading strips, just do it for every single one, okay? So let's talk about normal sinus rhythm. If I was doing the five-step analysis, this is what I would tell you. Your rate is going to be between 60 and 100 beats per minute. It is regular. You have one P before every QRS complex, and your P's are similar in appearance. I tell you your PR interval is between 0.12 and 0.20. Your QRS is between 0.06 to 0.10, okay? This is what we want everybody to be in. We want everybody to be in normal sinus rhythm because we know that's when the heart is at its most effective, okay? So you have already told me when you looked on this strip, you've already said that my rate was what? 70. 70. Now the second thing I want you to look at, look at it and tell them if it's regular or not. Look at the space between your R to R's. And what you will find is it's regular. Now, let's look at P's. Do I have a P before every QRS? And are they similar in appearance? Okay. Then you look at your QR, your QR intervals. So remember you go from the beginning of your P to the beginning of your QRS. And if that one is four boxes, then how many boxes should this one be? Four. Okay, well how about this one? Four. And this one? Four. And this one? Four. And this one? Four. And this one? Four. So you're telling me they all should be that? Correct, they all should be constant. And then the last thing you look at is your, you look at your QRSs. One, you make sure they're similar in appearance, and two, you make sure they're within defined limits. This is what we compare everything to. This is what we want everybody to be in, normal sinus rhythm. So that's our goal when someone has cardiac issues is to get them back in normal sinus rhythm. So let's talk about sinus braiding, okay? If you are doing your five-step analysis on sinus braiding, the first thing that you would determine is that your rate is less than 60 beats a minute. Your rhythm would be regular. When you look at your P wave, what you will notice is that you do have a P wave before every QRS, and your P waves are similar in appearance. Okay. 
your PR interval will be within defined limits. And your QRS complex will be within defined limits. Guys, the only thing that's wrong is just too slow. That's the only thing that's wrong in sinus braiding. Okay? So when you analyze this, what did you tell me your rhythm was? 40. You told me it was 40. Now look, is it regular or irregular? It's regular. Now do I have a P before every QRS and are they similar in appearance? Okay. And then when I look at my PR intervals, are they within defined limits and they're consistently the same? Okay, what about that QRS? Are my QRSs all similar in appearance? And they're all within defined limits. The only thing that's wrong, guys, is just too slow. So let's talk about that and what that means. So when you talk about sinus braiding, realize that for some individuals, it is completely normal. Okay. Um, people that it's completely normal in primarily are athletes. Okay. People that have well-conditioned hearts. So for example, um, people that do endurance, swimmers, runners, triathlons, and they just have conditioned their heart to where it doesn't need as much oxygen. It doesn't have to beat as hard. So for that individual, it might be completely normal for them just to have a resting heart rate of 40. They're completely asymptomatic. If someone is asymptomatic, we're not going to do anything about it. Asymptomatic means they don't have any symptoms. Okay? That their blood pressure is adequate to maintain that. However, what happens is if that blood pressure starts to, is not adequate, then that's when you're going to start having those signs and symptoms. Okay? So let's talk about some things that can cause sinus braiding. I told you it could be normal in someone who does endurance. Um, but lots of thing, other things that cause it. One is hypothermia. Okay? It could be because the person has an eating disorder. It could be because of um, heart disease. It can also occur with vomiting. The valsalic maneuver, remember bearing down like you're having a bowel movement? That's why in the hospital most people if they pass out is when they're on the toilet. And then you gotta go in that tiny little bathroom and get them out. Okay. It could also be, for example, like during suctioning. If you have someone who has a trach and you're suctioning and you're getting a little, you know, too aggressive with it, or you forget the patient has to breathe, their heart rate will start going down. Okay? All those things, guys, can cause sinus braiding. We can also cause it with medications. Think DIG, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. Any of that stuff that's going to lower that heart rate can potentially cause sinus braiding. That's why it's so important that you check their heart rate before you give DIG, before you give um, beta blockers. So one of the most important takeaway messages you can get is their symptoms are going to be related to decreased cardiac output. So we do not treat asymptomatic sinus brady. Asymptomatic means they're not having any problems, their blood pressure is adequate. We don't do anything. Okay, that's like the person that comes in for their physical and they're like, you know, a runner or something and they just have heart rate of 40 where their blood pressure is 120 over 30, have no complaints. Go with Jesus, you're good. <laughs> okay? We don't do anything. But if they're symptomatic, we can't let a person walk around in symptomatic sinus brady. We got to do something about it. So the symptoms you're going to see, like I said, decreased cardiac output. So the person's become very pale, very sweaty. They'll start um, have fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath. They can be, even become dizzy. They can even have periods of confusion because they don't have enough oxygen going to the brain. Okay? You can't let a person walk around in symptomatic bradycardia. Or not for very long. How about that? So what we have to do is we got to intervene. So of course we're going to give them oxygen because we know they don't have enough circulating. But one of our primary focuses is we got to get that heart rate back up to at least 60, guys. So oftentimes what we do is we will give a medication called atropine. Okay. 
So atropine, it, what it does is it increases the overall heart rate. Okay, we give it IV. We also try and figure out what's the underlying cause here. Is it because I didn't check their heart rate before I gave that beta blocker this morning? That might be an issue. So if it's medication related, then we'll do, we'll hold some medications, we'll do an adjustment with their meds. Um, sometimes we might even have to put them on an external pacemaker. If we gave that medication and let's say they had a heart rate of 40 and we didn't check it, and we, we gave that ditch, and so now they have a heart rate of like 30. We know they're not perfusing well, so we have to help them out. And so sometimes we'll put them on um, an external pacemaker. So an external pacemaker, here's another thing I want you to, um, when you go to your um, hospital tomorrow, an external pacemaker typically is on your Zoll, okay, or it's on your crash cart, and we call it a Zoll. So go and look at your crash cart. You can look, just don't touch, don't break any locks or anything, but go and look at it. What you will see is you will have pads on the crash cart and these pads, um, you can use them to pace or you can use them to defibrillate. So what you would do in this circumstance is you would make, I call it a heart sandwich, okay? You would put one pad in the front and one pad in the back. Then you would hook it up to the Zoll and on the Zoll you have all these different functions. So you have one that says pace. So you would just click it to the pace. Okay, and then what happens is the physician comes and he determines what the capture he wants. He determines what he wants to set it at. All you really are responsible for doing is maintaining it. You watch the heart rate, make sure it stays in the setting that he wants it to or she wants it to be in, and you make sure that your patient maintains bed rest. Why do you think we want them on bed rest? Because the heart's not Oh, what do you mean? It takes, it takes more effort to do this than to lay there? Absolutely. So we don't want them moving around. We want them to stay in the bed. They, I know they don't like a urinal, but they're either going to use a urinal or a bedpan. We don't want them exerting a lot of effort because their heart's just not able to keep up with the metabolic demands. The other thing is, is when you put them on an external pacemaker, the only thing that's keeping them there is, is those pacer pads. And it's like a big sticker, so it can come off. So that's why we want them there. We want them to just um, consume a little amount of energy as possible until we fix it. So if it's because we messed up with the meds and there was too much order and we gave it until those meds started wearing off, or it might be because the person just needs an internal pacemaker. And if that's the case, they'll, we'll, do, we'll pace them externally until the um, cardiologist can put a internal pacemaker in them, okay? So those are some things that you're gonna see done um, for a person who's in sinus brady. If we determine that they're in sinus brady because they just don't have enough volume, let's give them some volume. Let's give them some LR, let's give them some PES band, something to expand the volume, okay? Because sometimes that, that could contribute to it and be a cause. One of the other things, or I should say, let's go to the other side and let's talk about sinus tack. So in sinus tack, guys, the only thing that's wrong here is your rate's too high, okay? So if I was doing my five-step analysis on sinus tack, the first thing I would determine is that my um, rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. The second thing that I would do when I did my five-step method is I would, I would determine that my rhythm is regular. Then remember, we go and look at those P waves. And what you notice is you have a P wave before every kick, QRS, and they're similar in appearance. And then when you look at your PR interval, you'll notice they're consistently the same. And then your QRS is when you look at your QRS complexes, they're all similar in appearance, and they're within the parameters. The only thing that's wrong here, guys, is just too fast, okay? So, on this one right here, what is your rate? 120. 120, does everybody see the 120 up here? Okay, so that's the first thing. Now tell me, is this regular or is it irregular? Mm -hmm. This is regular. Do y'all see the P waves before the QRSs? Now, I will tell you, sometimes the faster the rhythm gets, the harder it can be to identify the P's because it's just so fast, okay? But you do have a P before every QRS. 
and your P's are similar in appearance. And if you were to count out your PR intervals, your PR intervals be, would be less than five small boxes. And then if you look at your QRSs, they're all similar in appearance. The only problem here, guys, is this is just too fast. So let me just kind of talk to you a little bit about sinus tap, okay? So when you think about sinus tap, I want you to realize that sinus tap initially enhances cardiac output. Okay. Initially, it's good. So underline initially. So initially, it enhances cardiac output, and it also enhances the blood pressure. However, over time, what happens is it leads to a decrease in the ventricular filling time. It leads to a decrease in the ventricular filling time. So I'm going to tell you what that means for an individual. Okay. So when you have a decrease in your ventricular filling time, uh, ultimately it leads to a decrease in cardiac output and a decrease in blood pressure. Okay. So initially, sinus tack, yay, it's good, increases um, cardiac output, increases um, blood pressure. However, over time, boo, it's bad because it's going to lead to a decrease in cardiac output, okay, decrease in blood pressure. So one thing I've always asked is, well, I mean, I want a time. Like, what do you mean initially and, and over time? I need an hour. What hour? can't tell you that. It's that gray area. And here's why. It depends on the entire clinical picture. How fast is the rate? Okay, what else is going on with this person? Just realize that a person can't tolerate sinus tap for an extended period of time without having some ramifications. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're the, the uh, triage nurse and you're triaging patients. Uh, you have an 83 year old come in who's in sinus tap, we'll say sinus tap 160, okay? Um, she's confused. She's coming from the nursing home. She has an underlying history of COPD and um, congestive heart failure. You suspect she has a UTI, okay? So then let's say that you have a 60-year-old gentleman come in, um, and he was at the Alabama-Auburn game and partied a little too hard, had a little cocaine, and now he's in, <laughs> hey, it happens. Now he's in sinus tack at 163. So they're both in sinus tack. Which client do you think is going to start having a downward trend? So why do you tell me the older lady? What comorbidities does she have that increases her likelihood of a downward decline? Heart failure, UTI, Heart failure, UTI and COPD. COPD. So do you see, and her age, just think about your age in general. The older you are, you can't handle those, those changes. So you see, they came in with the same rate, but because of the clinical picture, that lady is going to have a downward trend probably quicker than our gentleman over here. Okay, so that's why I can't give you like from two to four hours. Just realize you can't be in sinus tap for a prolonged period of time and not have some ne negative ramifications there, okay? The other thing you have to realize is that sinus tack is sometimes normal. Think about it, okay? Look at some of these things. Think about anxiety, fear. Think about the first check off you ever had. <laughs> Were you not nervous? No, I just made some beds. That was, that was good. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. You must have had that really nice Miss Williford, okay? That's what you must have had. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to get those type of people checking me off. But, so sometimes sinus tack is normal. Because think about it. Anxiety, fear, exercise. Does your heart, not, heart rate not increase with exercise? Walking up some stairs. But the difference is when you stop being scared or you're not anxious or when you stop exercising, your heart rate comes back to that 60 to 100 beats. So sometimes it's normal, okay? We also have some <laughs> conditions that predispose a person to develop in sinus tack. One, of course, is infection, okay? So oftentimes people that have 
hyperthyroidism, they have sinus tact. We also have to look at some of the other conditions. Uh, for example, if a person's anemic or they, they hurt, guys. Remember, oftentimes you learn back in fundamentals when somebody hurts, their heart rate will increase. Okay. So it could be pain. It could also be um, hemorrhage. Again, body's trying to compensate there. So we do have medical conditions that can cause it, and you also gotta look at the lifestyle. The two biggest things with lifestyle is um, what are they doing rec recreationally, okay? And then how much caffeine are they ingesting? Caffeine, in small amounts, is quite lovely, okay? However, when you get too much caffeine, your heart just doesn't know what to do with it, okay? So you'd be surprised about the things that contain caffeine, um, our primary culprits, of course, are energy drinks, okay? Um, how about Starbucks cold brew nitro? They won't even get you, but I like the vintage. They won't give you that. They'll just give you like the little medium. What's that? That's not going to do much for me. But it has lots of caffeine in it. Uh, Rockstar, five-hour energy, those types of things, your body just doesn't know what to do with it. So it will cause you to go into sinus attack. Medications. Any type of stimulant, guys, okay? Cocaine's a stimulant, meth's a stimulant. So that's why I use that, because that's usually what happens um, when I used to work at ER on Friday and Saturday. People would party and they'd come in and they just, <laughs> you'd be surprised at who, who does cocaine. You really Rick Flair, Rick Flair. But it will cause uh, sinus attack. Diet pills are another one that's really bad. Okay. And oftentimes one of the um, demographics that we don't ask enough about are men. We usually always think of diet pills, you think women. But studies have shown that actually among our younger men, um, they are using and abusing diet pills more so than our females now. Pre-workouts so, too. And what? Pre-workouts. Oh yeah, pre-workouts. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you can't just exclude based on what gender they are. Okay. Everybody wants to look good. So these are things you gotta you gotta be aware of. Okay. So the other thing you realize is once we've ever identified this person's in sinus attack, then we gotta do something. Okay. So what we focus on is we focus on one determining what it is that's causing it. Okay. Now realize the lower the rate, the better tolerated this sinus attack is. So the overall symptoms your patient's going to present with depends on what the rate is. Because think about it, if someone's sinus attack 110 versus sinus attack 160, wouldn't you expect to see more signs of decreased cardiac output in my person who's sinus attack 160 versus my person who's at 110? Absolutely, okay? And the neat thing about all of these um, dysrhythmias we talk about Two things going on, decreased cardiac output or risk for decreased cardiac output and perfusion. Those are your two main issues because what you're going to notice is as you study them, a lot of the signs and symptoms look exactly the same because the primary difference in most of them is the mechanism, what's causing it. Is it sinus brady causing decreased cardiac output? Is it sinus tac causing decreased output? Okay. So don't let that get you, but realize they're going to have decreased cardiac output. So again, they'll become pale, they'll become sweaty, they'll have fatigue, they'll have weakness, they'll have shortness of breath. Sometimes they'll experience anxiety because they can't seem to get their breath, okay? Their blood pressure will start dropping. So what we have to do is figure out what's causing it. Is it caffeine? Okay. Is it recreational drugs? Is it medications? Maybe they're thyroid medications. What is it? Okay. So that's our primary focus is trying to figure out what caused it and eliminate that if at all possible. The other thing we want them to do is their heart's working really hard. So we want them to rest. We don't want them up. We don't want them walking around. We want them to sit down or lie down because then they won't consume as much oxygen. We know we're going to put oxygen on them because, remember, they're not circulating like they should. 
So we are gonna put some extra ones. If it's if they have sinus tap because they have infection, hey, let's treat it. First off, let's go ahead and get the antibiotic in them, and then let's give them something for that fever. Okay. If they're sinus tap because they don't have enough volume, let's give them some volume. So we try and treat whatever's causing it. Okay. If it's because of pain, then let's give them some pain medicine. Sometimes, though, for some people, we can't figure out why they're in a sinus tack. That's just, they just are. And for those individuals, typically what we will recommend is a low-dose daily beta blocker. Because remember, a beta blocker is going to drop their heart rate. Our goal is to get them between 60 to 100 beats per minute because that's, what's, that's the most proficient for the heart. So we'll start them on just a low dose. And we do a low dose because uh, beta blockers, when someone starts them, they often have um, a lot of side effects, the biggest one being fatigue. And a lot of times your patients will just tell you, I just don't feel well, I'm tired all the time. You just gotta let them know that that's normal to feel that way um, while they're transitioning to the medications. It will get better with time. But that's why you always start them on a low dose. And as they become used to the medication, they won't feel so tired anymore. You also, if you're going to put someone on beta blockers, you want to educate them on making sure they get their heart rate before they start, which is blood pressure. Oftentimes, we like them to keep a little log. And the reason that is, when they go back to see their cardiologist, it's just like a comparison of seeing what's, what's going on here. What's your blood pressure been? How's your heart rate been? And we might titrate the medications based on what their logs show. Okay? So those are things that we do for sinus tech. Okay? Now, let's talk about, I got time. You've got time. Let's talk about AFib, AFlow. Hey, here's a great thing. There's only two of them, guys, so your atrial is with you. Okay, so you got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> 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 hey, those are good odds. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Well, I got a question. Now, you said we had like 15 um, rhythms, right? Uh-huh. So uh, about approximately how many of the questions um, with the interventions associated with rhythms? Um, let's see. Well, 15, you got 50 questions. 15 are going to be strips. Mm -hmm. All the others. All the others. So it's either going to be on a acute MI or CAD. Well, no, I mean specifically with the rhythms, associated with the rhythms, you know. You got ah, this rhythm. don't, don't lock me into a number. I haven't oh, made it yet. Oh. I just know you have 15 strips. Okay. okay? But the rest is all up yet. I don't know all that. So let's talk about atrial dysrhythmias. You'll like these guys because they're easy to tell apart. Okay? For real, they are. You'll see. You'll see. So with atrial dysrhythmias, hey, if I'm going to know what's going on with the atrial, what do I look at? What was the question? I'm sorry. I was, I was That's okay. If I want to know what's going on in the atria, what part of the cardiac cycle do I look at? The P waves. Yes, your P waves. Okay? So you know if it's an atrial dysrhythmia, my P waves are going to be messed up here. Okay? So that's one of your key features of your atrial dysrhythmias. So, first one I want to talk about, I want to talk about atrial fibrillation. Oftentimes in practice, we refer to it as AFib. Okay, so let's do the five-step analysis. Let me give you your, your five rules for it. In AFib, your rate is going to vary. I know you don't like that, but if your rate is below 100, it's called controlled. Okay, if your rate is above 100, it's called AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response. What you got for me? So what if it's bouncing between 120 and 80? So then that person would have intermittent AFib. Okay. Um, 
as far as, are, you mean like they're going from normal sinus to AFib or their rates no, no. just bouncing? Yeah, their rates just all over the place. Then we're going to treat them like it's uncontrolled because they're not staying below that 100. Okay. What you got? Can you that one more time? Uh-huh. Sure. When you look at your rates associated with AFib, if you have a rate that's less than 100, okay, so like 60 to 100, then that's called controlled meaning your rate is controlled. In controlled AFib, your patient won't have a lot of signs or symptoms because their rate's controlled, okay? Now, when the rate gives above 100, we call that AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response, or some people call it rapid ventricular rate. Either one is, is fine. So when it, that heart rate goes up above 100 and it's um, AFib with RB4, RVR, you're going to see more signs and symptoms. Okay. So the second step, Amanda, we look at the rhythm. In AFib, your rhythm is irregular. So remember guys, then our third thing to look at is we look at our P waves. When you look up here, do y'all see any clearly defined P waves? No, you just kind of see, I mean, you like might see one P wave right there at the very beginning over there. But that's it, you don't see, all you see is chaos between the QRS complexes. You don't have clearly defined Ps. So if I don't have clearly defined Ps, can I measure a PR interval? You can't. So therefore, my P waves are not clearly defined, and I can't measure a PR interval. Now, when you look at your QRSs, what you notice about your QRSs is that they are all similar in appearance, and the duration is within normal limits. So when you think about AFib, I want you to think about a very chaotic rhythm with no clearly defined P waves. It's ugly. So currently, we have over 2 million Americans walking around with AFib and they don't know they have it because their rate's controlled. Okay. But what you have to realize here is there are some risk factors for the development of AFib. One of those is age. The older we get, the more likely we are to develop AFib. Another big risk factor is hypertension, guys. Okay. Followed closely by diabetes. Also, if a person has congestive heart failure or any type of valve disease, it makes them more prone to develop AFib. Or if they have, this is very common, especially following any type of open heart surgery. Okay, so you'll be probably dealing with people that have AFib. So once you suspect your patient has AFib, let's talk about what we do. We wanna hook them up to EKG and verify. What we're looking for, we're looking to see, hey, is this like all the time or is it intermittent? Intermittent means it comes and goes. They'll have runs of like normal sinus rhythm and then they'll have some runs of AFib. Normal sinus and AFib. They're not staying in AFib consistently. Chronic means they just always are in AFib. We tend to call those people chronic fibbers. I know that's a horrible name, but that's what we call them, chronic mm -hmm. fibbers, okay? And what that means is, despite medical intervention, they just stay in AFib. So in AFib, what you have to realize, the symptoms that the patient will have depends on the overall ventricular rate. So as I said, if their rate's 80, they probably don't have any signs or symptoms. But if their overall ventricular rate is 180, that kind of probably has some um, signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output. Okay? So again, it'll be the fatigue, the weakness. They'll have the shortness of breath. And because AFib is very irregular, you can even have um, or even notice a pulse deficit. Okay?
they oftentimes will become very anxious. And again, hypotension is an issue there. So in AFib, what you have to realize is they are the risk for, a, for an embli. And let me talk to you about why. Okay, so this is my heart. Use your imagination. But here's my heart, okay? Top part of the heart is called the what? Atria. Yeah, and the bottom is the awesome. Okay, so in AFib, my ventricles are doing what they're supposed to. They're squeezing. When they squeeze, blood comes out to the body, meets the metabolic demands, okay? So while my ventricles are squeezing, the atria is just quivering like this. So the problem with that, two things. One, it doesn't give me a good, nice squeeze, so I lose that atrial kick. That's that little extra oomph before it sends it down to my ventricles and out through my body. So that's the first thing I've lost. The second problem is, is because it's quivering, blood is pooling in the atria. So guys, anytime you have an area where blood is pooling, you have a risk for a clot formation, okay? So that's why when someone's in AFib, we need to make sure they're on some type of anti-clotting um, agent, okay? More so than aspirin. There's lots of different kinds out there. Coumadin used to be the gold standard, but it's not so much anymore. You have Eliquis, you have all sorts of things. So I'm not so stuck on the fact that you know these different types. My biggest thing is that you realize they need to be on something to prevent an emboli. Because what happens is, if for whatever reason that clot makes it out to the ventricles and goes to the body, wherever it ends up, let's say it ends up in the leg, what is that person gonna have? DVT. Yeah, DVT. Let's say it ends up in the brain, what is that person gonna have? A stroke. A stroke. If it ends up in the lung, what are they gonna have? <laughs> yeah. If it goes to another of their heart, what can they have? An MI. So you see why it's really important with people that are AFib, they're on something to help keep their blood thin. Okay? So that's one of our um, our big things we need to do with a person who has uh, AFib. So our goal is to convert them back to normal sinus rhythm. That's our goal. Remember, that's our ultimate goal. So let's talk about ways we can do it. We always try and do least invasive first. So we're going to start with medications. IV medications to be exact. We'll bring them in the hospital setting and we will um, give them things like IV ditch, IV beta blockers, IV calcium channel blockers. Okay. Uh, for example, one that you often will see in practice, cardizin. Okay. And we will also give them anticoagulants because we know they're at a risk for an emboli. So if our IV meds are successful, and here's the thing, when you put someone on IV medications, antidysrhythmias, you have to check their vital signs very frequently. Typically, you follow your hospital protocol, and a lot of times it's Q one hour. You're checking your heart rate, you're checking your vital signs. Some people will keep them on continuous telemetry, as they should be, because you know we're trying to slow everything down, we're trying to convert them, okay? If with these IV medications convert them, that's great. What we will do, we will continue those same medications, but we'll convert them to PO medications. So we'll transition them off the IV, start them on the PO, and then they'll go home on PO medications. That's what we really like, if that's what we're able to do. But some people are resistant to medical treatment. The drugs just don't work on them, okay? Or they're not enough. So in that case, then what we would do, we would do something called cardioversion. So cardioversion is a procedure that we typically perform. It could be performed at the bedside, but usually we take them down to specials or the PACU setting, okay? Because the people that are with them have to be trained in ACLS, okay? What happens is we sedate the individual. Um, and then the cardiologist will deliver shocks to their heart, okay? So they hook them up just like they would for the, um, the pacing. We put a pad on front, a pad on back. The physician determines how many times they need shocked and what joules. So joules are a nice way of saying like amplitude, okay? Um, and then they deliver the shocks. Our goal is that what will happen is, remember, as soon as you shock it, it's gonna stop. And our goal is it just stops just for a few seconds and then boom, comes back normal sinus rhythm. The same premise, like think about your computers when your computers aren't working, okay? 
You've tried everything they tell you to do and none of it works. What do most of us do? Cut it off, cut it off. That's right, cut it off and cut it back on. Well, that's what we're doing with your heart. It's just a fancy way of saying it. Because most of the time what happens is you deliver that shock, it stops and then boom, innately it wants to go back into normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so that sometimes works. If that doesn't work, then what we can do, we can do uh, an ablation, okay? An ablation is where they go in through a um, cardiac catheterization type procedure. They have um, a cauterizing tool and the area of irritability that they think is causing the AFib, they will burn it off, they'll cauterize it, okay? If that doesn't work, we can do a maze procedure. So a maze procedure uses, it's a cauterizer and it does the same thing, but in a maze procedure, we actually open them up. So typically the maze procedure we will do um, like an open heart surgery, and usually we'll do things, um, let's say if they have CAD and they need some, some arteries bypassed, we'll do that. We don't like to do the maze procedure by itself because it is so invasive, it's open heart surgery. Um, but that is an option, okay? If all else fails and we tried all these things and the person just is stubborn and they're staying in AFib, well then our focus shifts a little bit. So what our focus is now on is rate control. So I can't fix their AFib, we tried all this and it's not working. So let me focus on that rate because if I can get that rate under control, then my signs and symptoms are gonna diminish and then I just need to make sure they, are, they stay on some type of anticoagulant as long as they're in AFib, okay? So that's kind of why the focus shifts a little bit. So, AFib, very ugly dysrhythmia. Now, your anti-dysrhythmia medications, they are presented to you on page 650, 651. I think you have a nice little chart. Um, and then you also have reading in that chapter that talks about some of them. So, you can look at those. So, I told you AFib is our ugly one, right? So, I'm going to give you our pretty one. This is a flutter. You see how pretty it is? So you just gotta remember which one's ugly and which one's pretty, and then you're good. Let's talk about a flutter. I'm gonna do your five step method, okay? So the first thing we look at is we are gonna look at the rate, okay? Typically, I can't give you like an always, typically your atrial rate, I tell you, is between 250 and anywhere to, it can even be up to 400 beats per minute but not all those impulses are getting into the ventricles. Could you, could you imagine having someone, you take their heart rate and that's what you got? They're not gonna be alive for very long. <clears throat> so what happens here is the atrium is, is, is firing off, okay? So in flutter, the AV node blocks the number of impulses that actually reach the ventricles as a protective mechanism. So yes, the atrium is firing off all these shots, but not all of them are going through, okay? That's because of that AV node. So your rate's gonna vary. Your rhythm is usually regular. Underline usually, y'all wanna hold me two things. So underline usually, and here's why, okay? Because if you have this nice, really pretty, really regular, a flutter and all of a sudden it starts becoming irregular, then what that tells you is that person's getting ready to convert to something else. Okay, so that's why I underline usually. Now, let's look at P waves. Hey, do you see any P waves here? No, these are called flutter waves. Okay, here's another example of flutter waves. Oh, you see all the Fs? Those are all the little flutter waves. So you don't have normal P waves. You have these flutter waves, which kind of have like a, I guess a saw tooth appearance or like a shark-like shark tooth appearance. So because I don't have P waves, remember, I can't measure a PR interval. And then your QR complexes are within defined limits, okay? So when you look at this one, what's my rate? What can you get? 
Everybody get 60? Yeah, 60. That's my overall ventricular rate. Is it regular or irregular? It's regular? Yeah. Now, go to your P waves. Do you see P waves? No, you don't see P waves. You see these flutter waves. So that's your key feature in any flutter is you have these flutter waves. So because I have those flutter waves, it's not a normal P, so I can't measure my PR interval. So then you look at your QRSs and you see your QRSs are within defined limits. Okay? So this is an atrial dysrhythmia, and so I'm going to treat it in the same manner as I would my AFib. Okay? So your symptoms are going to depend on the overall ventricular rate. What I mean by that, just like I talked about in AFib, if a person's in A-flutter at 80, they probably don't have that many signs and symptoms versus if they're in A-flutter at 280 or 180, okay? So the overall signs and symptoms of decreased cardiac output are very much rate dependent. And then our ultimate goal, where you, again, remember, is to convert them back to normal sinus rhythm. And so we will do that again with medications. Um, you know, we have, we can give DIG, we can give beta blockers, we can give calcium channel blockers. Okay. If that doesn't work, guys, then what we can do is we can do the cardioversion, again, to try and reset that heart to where it's going to go back in normal sinus rhythm. That doesn't work, and then we can do the ablation. <clears throat> the primary difference between your A fib and your A flutter, with A flutter, you don't worry so much about the emboli because the atria is not just quivering like it is in A fib. So you don't have to worry about that with the A flutter. But our whole goal, normal sinus rhythm. And guys, if we can't get them back to normal sinus rhythm, then our focus just changes to rate management. Okay? So I want you to analyze this one and tell me what you think. First thing, what's the rate? 70. 70. Is everybody good with that? Okay, is it regular or is it irregular? irregular. It's irregular, so you can automatically knock off normal sinus, sinus rhythm, sinus break, right? Because those are all regular, okay? So now go to your P waves. What, what do you notice? Do you have? The first one, but the first one. Yeah. Well, do you have clearly, de clearly defined P waves? No. So now you know what kind of, what kind of dysrhythmia is this? Now you know it's a what? If I don't have clearly defined, you know it's an atrial dysrhythmia because there's no clearly defined P's. So now I got to figure out which one is it. Okay. So it's irregular. So it's a fit. Control. Control. Very good. So try this one. Hey. Hey. <laughs> okay. You're just learning. I'm not going to throw really hard stuff up there. What's my rate? One what? 110. Everybody good with that? Okay. Is, is the whole strip? Uh huh. Because it's 12 QRS is on that whole strip. Who told me 10? Can we not count? No, I can't two, count. Three, four, I'm just five, coming six, in here seven, just eight, messing eight, us up. Two, Look at I'm that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You can't use a different one this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. I changed it up for this morning. Uh huh. Okay. So now I want you to look. Is it regular or irregular? Regular, everybody good with regular? Okay, go to your P's. Up, oh, what do you notice about P's? No, you don't have P's, right? You have these pretty little flutter waves. Okay? Hmm. So, can I measure a pair interval? No. My QRSs, are they within defined limits? So, what atrial dysrhythmia is this? Very good. Okay? So, Dr. Whitaker is going to talk to y'all about math. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> what are you 
gift. <laughs> He's just so excited about the knowledge. You're going to. Yes. Uh huh. Good. Did you? Yeah. Oh, you got to put your thing on. Did you tell them about graduation? I did. I told them about that. Okay, so make sure you get a scrap sheet of paper so you can work this with her. Because you're going to see more problems like that. Oh. Don't do that to us. Please wait till the fine. Please wait till the fine. What? Where is she? But she had to leave early. Oh, your child at us. Oh, okay. And I left my math papers up here. Right here. Oh. Oh. It's cold. Uh-uh. It's cold in here. Anybody need some scrap paper or are y'all good? I need some. Thanks. Okay. Hmm. I would give you my um my papers y'all turned in, but I gotta look at all those. <laughs> go talk to Dr. Radney and say, what are you teaching or not teaching? <laughs> I won't do that to you. Did you do the math or heart? An hour 
power is going to lead me to this minute right here that I need. So we've got a 12.5 milliliters per hour. Marking it out as I go so I know what I got. And then I know that one hour is 60 minutes. And minutes are something that I need. Am I through? Mm -hmm. No, because I also need kilograms down here. So this is where some students get messed up because you're used to putting kilograms over one person. But you got to put it where you need it. And we need it underneath. So it's one person and 75 kilograms. I didn't need to mark anything out up there. And now I have my kilograms, and everything else is marked out, except for my micrograms per minute per kilogram, or per kilogram per minute. Make sense? And when I do that out, what I come up with? What y'all come up with? 4.44 is correct, as it says to round to the hundred. Okay? Now, right up from there, oh, let's look at this one. It's right above. So this one says that I've got heparin 20,000 units and 500 milliliters of D5W at 50 milliliters an hour. And it's been going for 5 hours and 30 minutes. I discontinued it. I want to know how much heparin that patient got. Okay. So here's the time. 50 milliliters an hour. There's my mix. So what am I looking for? Units per dose. That's right. Units per dose. And what is my dose? 20,000. Oh, no, sorry. That's units. But my dose is going to come right there because that's how long I had it it was going for five and a half hours so I'm going to start my units right there and I've got 20,000 of them in 500 milliliters don't need that I need dose so I could say 50 milliliters per hour, which I got from right there. And now I've got, don't need hour, I need dose. Well, I know that it took me 5.5 hours to get all, that's what I'm looking to see, how much was in there. Does that make sense? Did everybody stay with me here? Because this is where most people get confused. Dr. Daniels? I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now I got my dose. Here and here. It's where it's supposed to be. Everything else is marked out. And when I got that answer right there, <coughs> bless you. Bless you. It was 11,000. units per dose. That's how much she got over that five and a half hours. 11,000 units of heaven. Okay? So, let's look at one thing. If you start getting numbers too big, do y'all know how to mark out? So I got two zeros down here. I mark out two up there. So now I'm multiplying 200 times 50 times 5.5 divided by 5. Okay? Alrighty. I did one other one this morning. Let me see what I got. I put 
they practice problem stuff on the um, oh, seven different places. <laughs> Let's see, number 19. I do number 19 this time. Okay. So this one, my tridial is infusing at 15 milliliters an hour on a pump. It's mixed 50 milligrams in 500. And I want to know how many micrograms per minute is the patient receiving. So there's no weight in here. Do you good for you? Micrograms per minute. Ask you right there. So that's what I'm looking for. This one's pretty straightforward. I've got 15 milliliters an hour. And I got 50 milligrams. So I'm going to have to do what? Convert my micrograms to milligrams. 50 milligrams in 500 milliliters. Milligrams, milligrams. And then I've got, I need minutes. I got milliliters left over. So 15 milliliters an hour. Now I can make this hour, one hour, into minutes. Okay, I got rid of my hours. There's my minutes. There's my microgram. Everything else is marked out. Okay. And this one can you can easily bring it down by saying 500 into 500 goes one time. 500 into 1,000, two times. That'll be a lot easier to deal with on your calculator. Just remember, when you do that, just do the same thing to the bottom that you do to the top. Do the same thing to the top that you did to the bottom. Just look for something easy, like 500 and 1,000. Okay? Or you can mark out zeros. Like I can mark out the zero on the 50 and the zero on the 60. It doesn't matter what they are as far as minutes or milligrams when you're when you're making it smaller. You're just doing, you're just marking out the ten, the place, the places. And if that confuses you, just don't worry about it. Except that when you get some big numbers down here, sometimes that calculator will say error, error, <laughs> and it won't go that high. That's the only problem you might have with that. So work on that. Okay. And this answer was let's see, 25. Okay. Did that help? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Because you should have four points every test. You cannot make lower than a four. <laughs> <laughs> Because you, you got the math. <laughs> Always look at the positive. <laughs> okay, y'all got any other ones that you don't that mess with you? Are we good? Okay. Y'all have fun in clinical you tomorrow. Say these are on. Uh, I'll, I'll or, see if the remediation if it's on there. This is a remediation packet I had put together for math, so I'll upload it. How about I put it in the team file? Then I only have to do it once. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> okay, let me get my name.